Hello everybody and welcome back to another series review. Yeah, I finished up a lot of series recently so I'm in the process of filming and sort of delegating my thoughts on quite a few of them. Today is a series that took me a little longer than usual to finish because I was actually listening to it but I was borrowing the books from my library. And so whoever had the third one on audiobook held on to that thing for way too long. Okay, I was not pleased on how long I had to wait for that. Just saying, because I finished it in the span of like a couple of days. So whomever was on the wait list after me, you're welcome. I finished that quickly for you. But today I'm going to be talking about The Daughter of Smoke and Bone trilogy by Lainey Taylor. So the three books in this trilogy are Daughter of Smoke and Bone, Days of Blood and Starlight, and Dreams of Gods and Monsters. My copy of this is actually the Barnes & Noble exclusive edition, even though I know Barnes & Noble isn't the only ones that have it because I was in Canada and I was in chapters and I saw it there, so we're not the only ones who got this, but it's exclusive because it comes with a really beautiful limited edition signed art print here in the back. I don't know who drew this, but I want to throw a guess that it was Jim DeBartolo because I know he is Lenny Taylor's husband and his art is beautiful. This trilogy is one that has been pretty much raved about by, by just about everyone who's read it here on booktube and it took me a while to consider even picking up this series for a couple reasons. One, be, despite the fact that now I have a deep appreciation for these covers and the fact that they all match and they're all very beautiful, I wasn't 100% sold on this cover when I first saw it. Two, anybody on booktube who has read this will tell you that it's quite a complicated story. Far more complicated than anybody can really do it justice when trying to sum it up. And unfortunately, somebody tried to sum it up for me and they didn't do a particularly good job. So all I was left doing was standing there like this going, I'm not real sure I want to read this. It was also unfortunately shelved near some like teen paranormal romance, which isn't 100% my thing anymore. <laughs> so I wasn't real sure I was gonna like it all that much. I drew some conclusions which were very untrue about these covers and what the content of the book was therefore going to be and I deeply apologize to these books because I really love these covers now and these books are phenomenal. So like I said um, this is a fairly complicated story but I will do my best to sum this up in some way. And by sum this up I mean we're sort of gonna talk about the first book and then I'll briefly touch on the second two because the thing about this trilogy is Daughter of Smoke and Bone is very self-contained in a way, although it does leave off in a sort of cliffhanger. But the primary plot of this whole story takes place amidst the final two books which are Days of Blood and Starlight and Dreams of Gods and Monsters. So I might talk about these almost like they're their own separate thing. Kinda. Not too sure. Can you tell that I'm doing this without a script? Daughter of Smoke and Bone is the story of a young artist by the name of Karu who lives in Prague. She's about, I think they say around 16 years old, and she has bright blue hair, which I thought was really cool. You can't see my fab blue streaks right now, but obviously I love people with blue hair. Rock on. As I said, she's a young artist, she's studying art in school, and her side job is collecting teeth. Yeah, teeth. No human teeth, only animal teeth. And she does this for her surrogate family. I say surrogate because it's pretty clear she's an orphan because her family is made up of chimera. Chimera, coming from the group Chimaira, was a creature in Greek mythology who was a hybrid of three different animals, a lion, a snake, and a goat. The Chimera was eventually defeated by the hero Bellerophon, or Bellerophon, who did so by riding atop the Pegasus and placing a piece of lead down the fire-breathing Chimera's throat. The lead melted and the creature ended up essentially poisoning itself. But needless to say, the creature was a monster, it was the bad guy. Lady Taylor has taken upon that idea of these sort of hybrid creatures and chimeras are essentially a mixture of a minotaur-esque style race meets like Frankenstein's monster. The minotaur aspect for me comes from the fact that Karu's surrogate father, Brimstone, has the head of like a ram, even though the Minotaur, I know, had the head of a bull. Come on, I know my mythology, guys. But the rest of him is human. The Frankenstein's monster comes from the fact that Brimstone is what is known as a resurrectionist. Yeah, he brings back the dead, but there's a lot of rules to this. This definitely brings up the best part of Lainey Taylor's trilogy, and that is that she has set a very serious set of rules for her kind of magic fantastical system 
game and world. The Chimera themselves have their own class distinctions depending on how much of a human aspect you have. So how human is your body in comparison to your animal parts? And the whole thing with being resurrected is that it's your soul. Your soul has to be captured in something called a thurible and if it's not in some way saved or captured, um, you die. That's it. Your body is dead and the resurrectionist strings together teeth with precious gemstones in order to build a body for you. It's really cool. Again, pretty complicated. I'm probably not even explaining it right to you, but it's a really great idea. And I love the fact that Lainey Taylor actually set some rules for her world and it's really fleshed out and really developed so well that I'm just like, cool. I dig it. But Chimera aren't the only creatures that are in this world. We also have Seraphim. Seraphim, coming from the Hebrew of Seraphim, is traditionally a type of celestial or heavenly being in both Judaism and Christianity. Within the angelic hierarchies in, in Judaism, Seraphs are fifth out of ten, I believe, and they are actually the highest rank in the Christian angelic hierarchy. Seraph actually also means literally the burning ones, and this is an important thing to remember. What's really cool about these seraphs is that they can literally generate their own fire and heat predominantly from their wings. The seraphim are basically the arch nemesis of the chimera and the two species hate each other. Again, just like with the Chimera, the Seraphim have their own set of ranks within themselves and it's essentially a class system. Again, brownie points, so many brownie points and awesome sauce points to Lainey Taylor for creating yet another set of rules to her fantastical world. This felt so much more fleshed out and so much more like a real world because all these different characters and these fantastical races were just like they were functioning civilizations with their own internal mythos with their own class systems with their own prejudices and it just made it so incredible I, i'm seriously kind of dumbfounded by just how amazingly detailed this world is now i'm sure you're sitting there wondering what does this have to do with karu well like i said her surrogate family is chimera and she's had no idea about this world of seraphim heck she hasn't even really known too much about her chimera family she just knows that she collects teeth and in return brimstone gives her wishes wishes are quite literally physical things that she can spend it's like currency in a way and just like with the class systems of the chimera and the seraphim wishes have their own ranks like some are worth more than others and when you make a wish it will cost a certain amount so hence they're all worth different things. I won't say too much more for fear of being extremely spoilerish and I've decided with the series I don't want to be super spoilerish in my review because that really does this whole trilogy an injustice. Daughter Smoke and Bone is very much a foundation novel. It is setting you up with the characters and the world and you realize you're gonna be following Karu and a particular seraphim by the name of Akiva for the rest of the story. They make for very good characters. I went into this novel and was told that there's a point where you're gonna not like the novel as much and I think I know what that point was and at first I was very skeptical but then ended up liking it and I was okay with it. The thing that I was told I probably wouldn't like was the insta-love, but I actually think that Lainey Taylor avoided my biggest pet peeve of insta-love by showing a hitherto unknown history between Karu and Akiva. I say no more for fear of spoilers. Continuing on, Days of Blood and Starlight and Dreams of Gods and Monsters basically deal with this massive seraphim chimera war. The war has sort of already been going on for a while, as I said, Seraphim and Chimera are complete arch nemeses and they despise each other to no end. But there's been almost a cessation of hostilities in a way and we're just watching it all break right on out again because Karu starts taking over Brimstone's job as a resurrectionist. Another really, really cool thing about this especially in Dreams of Gods and Monsters, is that the media gets involved. Now there's a lot of division when it comes to the involvement of media and fantastical worlds. Brandon Sanderson, who's a very famous fantasy writer, I don't think I need to explain who he is, had talked about this in one of his lectures on creative writing for science fiction and fantasy, and he said one of the big issues with the Harry Potter series was in book five when the media really got involved, because all of the sudden J.K. Rowling had to justify her magic system for why we're doing what we're doing. 
Um, I'm sort of split. I think if it's done really well, I don't mind too much the idea of the media getting involved. In the case of Lainey Taylor's trilogy, it makes a lot of sense because this story is taking place within, like, two different worlds. You have Earth and you have Eretz. But because it's in Earth and we're dealing with Chimera and angels, we're not just gonna walk around, oh hey look, there's a Chimera. Oh hey look, angels are falling from the sky. No, humans are gonna be like, the fuck is going on? And that's pretty much what happens, especially in Dreams of Gods and Monsters, because Earth gets involved and pretty much sits center stage for most of this. Lainey Taylor doesn't necessarily try to justify her magic system so much as deliberately has various characters involve the media in what they're doing because the media is an extremely powerful thing. Is she commentating on media in the same way that say Suzanne Collins tries to with the Hunger Games? No, we're not talking about reality television. This is actually more of the, hey, who's putting out the message and how it's being spun is really important to whom gets portrayed as a good or a bad guy. Overall, this series was absolutely brilliant. I think I gave all these books four or five stars out of five. Really, they would all sit at a solid between 4.5 and 5 because they are amazing. The world is so beautifully complex and amazingly developed by Lainey Taylor, especially in the first book, which is the shortest of the three and has the most information it has to dump at you but it doesn't feel like an information dump it's woven beautifully throughout the prose and the prose by the way is gorgeous Lainey Taylor's style of writing in these novels is just mind-blowingly good there's so much going on here it's incredibly rich that's the only word I can really think of to properly describe this trilogy and that is rich do yourself a favor and check it out I think you'll really really enjoy this but that's all for me tonight, you guys, and so until next time, cheers.